Happy Wellness Wednesday, everyone. Uh, today we're talking about a really important topic and it is adrenal fatigue. And it is a 21st century illness. As far as I'm a naturopathic doctor, I see it in practice all the time. We are all collectively experiencing adrenal fatigue right now. I can guarantee you that. Um, so we're looking at what the causes of adrenal fatigue are. And I just wanna start off with a little bit of an idea of how stress actually affects you. And you know, when you're looking at stress, think about it as a lion and a zebra in the jungle. And I was in um, a couple of years ago in Nairobi, Kenya, on a safari, and I got to see a lion and a wildebeest together. And you know, the wildebeest ended up going away. So the two things that happen is either the, there's fight or flight, right? So the wildebeest is either going to fight the lion or going to run away. And that's a, a stress response that, you know, we get immediately when we're undergoing some kind of um, event. So stressful uh, event can be, can turn into anxiety down the road. So this wildebeest obviously ran away and these spurts of stress and anxiety are less so, I'm just bringing in here, are less so with these, with wildlife because they're able to fight or flight and these events are short lived. With us, we're constantly in a situation where we're fighting and flighting, you know, and or fleeing <laughs> other. And I'm just talking about the issue of the stress response piece. We have Keith joining us here uh, from New York. And um, what happens, I'm talking about a wildebeest and a lion in the jungle. And what happens, you know, obviously when the wildebeest runs away, what happens is the blood from the digestive system, 30% of it's lost, you know, and that loss of blood then prevents the digestive system from working optimally. Now, that happens only short-lived for these guys. But for us, we're constantly in this fight or flight situation. So imagine 30% of your blood flow gone to your gut all this time and creating all these problems. So here we are to discuss adrenal fatigue, which is the result of ongoing stress. Keith, I, um, I posted a, a, some lovely pictures of adrenal face, and we're gonna walk through those faces later on and sort of go through sort of the cortisol balance and, and what that all means. What does adrenal fatigue mean to you as a medical doctor? Because- First of all, I was trying to match my face. I was trying to match my face. I was trying to figure out which one I was. <laughs> I've been all of them at one point, for sure. <laughs> and before I get there, so I, I read an article, this is about 20 years ago. Yeah. In the United States, people go through 62 fight or flight events a day, a day, from the phone ringing to the doorbell. That's crazy. To on their name. And in Europe, it was probably in the 20s. So it's really interesting how our lifestyle is so stressful. And this is almost 20 years ago. Imagine what that number is today. So that's 62 events a day. So that means you're shutting blood supply off your gut, your digestive system, about 62 times a day. And that's an average. And, you know, that was before the pandemic. So. And in New York, it may be 100. <laughs> Sorry? <and> you... <laughs> yeah. So adrenal fatigue. So adrenal fatigue, and, and I think this is often confused, and that's why a lot of people don't understand what it is. They often confuse it with a medical disease called Addison's disease. Right. So the difference is in Addison's disease, your body doesn't make cortisol. You're actually cortisol deficient. Where in adrenal fatigue is it actually over time from too much cortisol secretion, your body can no longer keep up with what it needs. So the cortisol production ends up dropping over time because of over stress and over usage. Right. And that's, I think, one of the biggest problems is when you go and see a conventional medical doctor and you tell them, you know what, I think I have adrenal fatigue. And of course, they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, fine, I'll do the tests, you know, come in in the morning and I'll take your blood for cortisol. That's not a good example of measuring, you know, your cortisol because it's about the diurnal variation of cortisol throughout the day. And we, you and I both know the best way to test that is through saliva. Yeah, and actually it's been studied. So first of all, we got to give naturopathic doctors credit, right? Because adrenal fatigue was actually coined by a naturopathic doctor in 1998. James Wilson, not a medical doctor, but a naturopathic doctor. Very important. He called it I the 21st century he... syndrome. 
Yes, yes. I didn't know he was the first one to coin that term. That's cool. So we got Yay, to... naturopathic doctors, and thank you, Dr. Keith, for letting us know. <laughs> and so one of the things is, is again, we often, people come in in the morning and measure blood. But actually, the National Institute of Health did a study. They looked at three different types of measuring cortisol. They looked at blood or serum. They looked right. at urine and saliva. And they found what matched most commonly how a person was doing was actually saliva. And when the key testing point is we actually measure four samples. We do a, a one upon waking. We often do one at new time, one in the afternoon or early evening, and one at bedtime. And what we're looking for is a pattern. Cortisol is always highest in the morning because we have to wake up. And it should be always lowest at midnight when we're sleeping, I hope. So exactly. Yesterday I had someone who didn't go to sleep till 6 a.m. I'm like, that doesn't really work. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's messing. Totally. Think of the morning. You know that commercial, that American commercial with the whole family's zest fully clean and they're all running around <laughs> in the morning. And that's how you should be feeling in the morning. You should be feeling completely rested, really, you know, happy, ready to go. Don't need coffee to wake yourself up. That's healthy cortisol. And then at night, you should be feeling nice and relaxed and ready to sleep. So if you have those two going, chances are you have good cortisol. So we talk about in COVID pandemic, you know, the new, new thing what people do. It's called the vicious cycle of coffee in the morning, alcohol at night. So okay. people can't get up in the morning and they can't go to sleep <laughs> properly. So they're constantly under stress. Right. I, I like a nice analogy. There was an author called James Joyce that never put a period at the end of sentences. So that's what the body's like. You never have a break. It's constantly going wow. again and again and again. And eventually we run out of gas. And that's the problem that people are facing. Right. So it's these lifestyle habits that we're all doing that are preventing us from getting those optimal cortisol levels. Because it is possible, guys, you can get those optimal cortisol levels. And guess what else cortisol does? It prematurely ages you. So we're going to get into all of that in a minute. But just to keep you on your toes to get you to want to get your cortisol levels optimal. If your cortisol levels are not optimal, you will age prematurely. That's just a fact. And we've seen it with, you know, test after test, patient after patient. I've seen patients for 20 years. And as soon as you balance their cortisol levels, people will be like, what have you done? You look 10 years younger. And so, you know, this is something that we really want to talk about in terms of uh, cortisol. And we always talk about two main topics that go along with it are sex hormones, get right. affected by cortisol. And number two is thyroid. So right. again, the more we have cortisol, the more our thyroid has to work, the more our sex hormones are affected and the less sex hormones we have available to be used. People don't realize that the production of cortisol requires progesterone. So progesterone can either make cortisol or actually work on helping make estrogen and testosterone. And I think we can all agree, we kind of want the estrogen and testosterone. Absolutely. <laughs> and not the cortisol. No, we because estrogen <laughs> equals vision. Even our vision gets better when we have more estrogen. And what people don't realize, people will come to me, Dr. Nigma, I want to lose weight. Dr. Nigma, I want to look younger. Well, that all boils down to your cortisol. So, you know, that's something that I really want to get into with you. Keith, what is cortisol? But what, you know, for people listening, how do we explain it to them in a layman's term in terms of what is cortisol? And why so we'll start with where does it come from? It comes from these yes. two tiny little grapes in our body called adrenal glands that kind of sit on top of our kidneys. They weigh about five to eight grams. The problem is that those adrenal glands are our stress hormone producing glands. So cortisol is one of our main stress hormones that helps us. And again, your great example, the wildebeest before, helps the wildebeest escape the, was it the line? Escape the, the line, line, live another yeah. day. So anytime our body's under stress, and that could be from low blood sugar, from lack of sleep, from emotional stress to working out, or any kind of stress, our body is going to say, hey, I need more energy. I need more glucose. I'm going to make more cortisol. Right. And because it needs it, right? And, it, and it's fine in short terms, right, to do all of that. And, you know, with the wildebeest and the line situation, they do that sporadically. They don't do that necessarily every day or 62 times a day, for example. <laughs> so I think it's super important that we need to think about how we are triggering this cortisol throughout the day. I think it's sustained because it is healthy to have cortisol levels um, rise and fall. Um, but the problem is, is when it's sustained, 
You know, that includes stress, Keith. It's important to have stress, but not the amount of stress that we're having. It's I think the important. greatest example I've ever seen is an upside down you. So having no cortisol, your body can't wake up in the morning, can't function. And then there's this right amount of cortisol to work. But then if you have too much cortisol, your body doesn't work either. So it's got to be right in the middle. And that, again, we like want to that. wake up. We want to kind of be level throughout the day. And we want to actually be able to turn it off and sleep at night. Absolutely. So, so the different variations in cortisol, the highest cortisol in the morning and then tapers off at around noon. Those people with blood sugar problems, Keith, their cortisol levels are imbalanced in the noon and afternoon uh, collection times. Right. And again, so when people have what we call an episode of reactive hypoglycemia or low yeah. blood sugar, what's the body going to do? The body says, hey, we got to raise glucose. So what does it do? It actually makes more cortisol. The, the people that are most susceptible to that are actually people with thyroid disease. So we talked about last time about thyroid, how people with thyroid disease can't take protein and make it into glucose as effectively as other people. So they have to secrete these cortisol or adrenal hormones to compensate for those low blood sugar episodes. And again, where do we see it? Late morning, mid afternoon, the periods when our blood sugar tends to drop. Right. Those afternoon crashes where you just want like a coffee or a chocolate bar or something to keep <laughs> you going. Um, so because you are the blood sugar expert, um, you're the most important thing to do when you are craving that, if, if you are in that cortisol uh, crash, are you recommending protein during that time? What are you recommending? So uh, what you want to do is have balance. So you want to have, and again, that's the key. So if you have too much glucose or carbohydrates, what are you going to do? You're just delaying the glucose spike right. by a few minutes. So you want to have a little, again, remember, 100% of carbohydrates become glucose, 40 to 50% of protein becomes glucose, but only 10% of fat. So by balancing some fat, and again, we talk always about easily absorbable fat, so it works quickly, mm -hmm. we're able to stabilize the blood sugar. And again, by keeping the blood sugar level, our body utilizes less cortisol. Yeah, so drizzle a little bit more olive oil on those vegetables, <laughs> more avocado, there's coconut as well. Uh, coconut oil is good. Any other oils that you recommend, Keith? I love avocado oil, you said. Coconut oil is great. I, one of my favorite foods for this are avocado because avocados are absorbed so quickly, they really have a great impact on stabilizing blood sugar quickly. And that's really the key. The quicker you stabilize it, the less cortisol your body needs. So I always do the protein and the avocado together because that just Correct. helps absorb. Okay, great. So let's talk about the other adrenal hormones, DHEA. Your favorite. Love DHEA. <laughs> I know. It's always I'm, about aging, right? And hormones. I know. I'm obsessed with DHEA. Let's talk about DHEA. Why is DHEA? What is DHEA and why is it important? So DHEA and cortisol, I always think of as a tug of war. Mm -hmm. So there's one on each side, yes. DHEA and cortisol, and they're both competing for resources. Cortisol right. wants the resources, DHEA. The problem is there's not always enough to share. So kind of you want DHEA to have the resources because DHEA is a hormone that is actually the precursor to estrogen and testosterone. Like the mother need. hormone, right? It's like <laughs> the mother hormone to all hormones. Right, so exactly. And again, we always talk about aging, you know, your favorite topic, you're the expert. DHEA is a major marker of aging. When DHEA levels actually drop as we get older, it's really critical because that prevents premature aging by having normal DHEA levels. Right. I know, I, and there's a lot of women that I test in like my age, I'm 48 years old, in and around my age, their testosterone levels are really low, but their serum DHEA levels seem like they're okay. It's because nobody's tested them for salivary DHEA. When you test salivary DHEA opposed to serum, blood serum DHEA, two different values and not a good value, to be honest, um, I wouldn't say the, the, it is correct when you're measuring blood DHEA, even if it's DHEAS. That's a great point. And again, having yeah. high levels of DHEAS is not necessarily a good thing because then you actually can actually put yourself at risk for high levels of estrione, which is the kind of estrogen that we don't want and that is often associated with cancer. So you're 100% right that you want usable DHEA, which is measured by salivary, rather than DHEA sulfate. 
Right. And quite often when I measure their DHE salivary, they're low. So I don't put patients on testosterone by a hormone right away. I will start with DHEA and then work my way up to a little bit of testosterone because DHEA really goes a long way along with supporting the adrenal glands. And then the person can make their own testosterone versus having it supplemental. However, it does help supplemental, but you have to dose it properly and you have to really be measuring and be on top of the patient. I don't just recommend throwing hormones at people. And I think people have to be careful. One of the, I mean, that's a great point, that yeah. testosterone can convert into estrogen, vice versa. So just because you think you're raising testosterone doesn't mean you're also not gonna raise other hormones with that. And that's really critical, especially with family history or risk factors for cancer. Absolutely, thank you for bringing that up because when you're giving testosterone, it's how somebody metabolizes that hormone. It's not necessarily you're giving testosterone, it's gonna help that person right away. If you keep giving that hormone, it is gonna convert into things like estrogen, which is, can be quite harmful, especially as you said, with family history. Okay, so we talked about DHEA. Why is DHEA so good? Like, I know it's anti-aging. I, I know it increases muscle mass. I know it increases you know, testosterone levels in the body. It helps sex drive. Um, God, That's just, not enough? <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm just thinking, am I missing something here? Um, metabolism, it helps the metabolism of nutrients. It also does that. So it's, it's, it's really, I mean, again, the mother hormone. So again, remember, I, I love the, the term you always use, the body's in concert, right? So you want I, yeah. good levels of everything so the body really functions optimally. And an optimally functioning body doesn't age as quickly. <clears throat> So then we have DHEA, um, which is super important. So that's one of the markers you should measure because that supports the adrenal glands. And then we have cortisol levels. And, um, and I think, about. sorry to interrupt, but one of the things <laughs> yeah. that people forget is we always think of our sex hormones being made in the ovaries or other areas. So mm -hmm. What people don't realize is about up to 40% of them can be made in the adrenal glands. So estrogen, testosterone, DHEA come from the adrenal glands as well. And that's important. So even people without ovarian function or, you know, their sex organs could still produce sex hormones. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very, very good point. So we talk now about, you know, the adrenal glands, how to test them. Um, somebody's asked about the Dutch hormone test, the salivary and urinary, urinary. excellent, very good test to, um, do you use the Dutch test, uh, Keith, in practice? Not I should use more because the one advantage to that is you not yeah. only get the hormones, but the metabolites that go along with it. And you're actually right. able to better figure out where the deficiency is rather than just saying estrogen or testosterone. You can look at all the metabolites that go along with it and see where the true problem is. So. Right. And that's, that's the key because you can see if people are, um, I mean, this is a whole other topic. Maybe we should do like one on, you know, perimenopause, menopause and measuring hormones and what to do. Um, but it gives you the metabolites is if you are you know methylate not methylating properly or you're going into different pathways like the comt pathway um and sort of what vitamins and minerals you need to support the metabolism of hormones because there are certain nutrients that certain people need and require based on how they metabolize hormone out of their body and so you may not want to give them so much estrogen or so much progesterone um, you want to be able to look at their hormone levels regularly versus just throwing them on hormones and going see you later. Actually, let's define what COMT is. People may not know. Yes. So COMT is a gene that actually regulates estrogen metabolism. And also some people feel that it also is common with MTHFR together, which is the right. gene that regulates folic acid and the methylation. And actually, there is some theories out there that it affects the body's ability to detox and the liver to get rid of excess hormones, especially from the body. And alcohol. So if you have this gene, the COMT gene, um, it increases your risk for bipolar, alcoholism. Uh, so it just sort of lets you know, like, okay, bit, be a bit careful. You know, maybe take some breaks off drinking alcohol. <laughs> Me included. Um, so yeah, you know, looking at like these polymorphisms or, you know, these SNPs in the DNA that we can measure to see, you know, what are your risk factors for certain mental illnesses and how you're going to react to alcohol? Because that means you're going to react negatively if you're drinking regularly 
all the time, uh, coffee in the morning and alcohol at night, like you said at the beginning, this, you know, pandemic diet um, is <laughs> really um, harmful to your adrenal glands and to your overall health and wellness, which, you know, can create um, chronic illness. So um, I think really people important. forget that alcohol and caffeine are both toxins and right. the body's always going to break them down first and liver. One of the problems with having a lot of that is you can't break down your nutrients. So the, right. the glucose, the proteins, the fats that you need for your body to work all get pushed aside until your body gets rid of either the caffeine or the alcohol. Exactly. And it puts pressure on the liver. Think of it this way. You know, we're all standing in queues going to grocery stores. I mean, sometimes I go, sometimes I order online. But when you stand in a, in a lineup or a queue to go to the grocery store, think of that lineup as the grocery store is the liver and you're the toxin lining up to go into the grocery store. If the lineup's too long, you're gonna leave, right? You're gonna leave. <laughs> and quite often when that, to that, that person leaves or that toxin leaves, um, it recycles and is more toxic when it re-enters the liver the second time. So when you're bogging down the liver with too much, you know, it can actually um, s uh, slow down the ability to let the other toxins to come in to get detoxified to then be cleared out by the kidneys. So it's an interesting, um, I know it's a weird analogy, but that's the analogy that I use, you know, when I'm looking at overloading the liver. And it's interesting you say that because a lot of people think for an adrenal fatigue, some of the etiologies have to do with toxins such as viruses, environmental toxins we're exposed to plastics, right. um, chemicals that are in the environment. And again, those trigger the adrenal glands from working much harder and utilizing more cortisol because the body can't get rid of those toxins and can't get them out fast right. enough. And that actually long term, a lot of people feel and a lot of early studies on adrenal fatigue really show that those could be the cause and major causative factors. If anyone has any questions, please put your question in the question section and then we can, um, we can answer them. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you love the cleanser. <laughs> oh, I think she's referring to your facial cleanser, not mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, thank you. Cha Cha Kingdom. Appreciate that. <laughs> Any questions, just put them in the question uh, section um, on the live so we can answer those. Um, okay, so, so far, um, now there's different kinds of adrenal fatigue um, that one can have. Um, Keith, let's talk about the initial one where people are initially, you know, they're, you know, CEOs, they're going, 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 they're a mother of three, you know, they've also got like, they're running a full-time business, they're a superwoman, they've got that high cortisol going, you know, um, what did I call it? I called it flying high, frazzled, but dazzled. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been down, I've been down that dusty road before. Let me tell you. Let's talk oh. about frazzled and dazzled. That that high cortisol. What what's happening to that person? So uh, there was a great theory going back to the 30s that discussed this. It was called the generalized adaptation syndrome. And what they talked about is how initially everyone had fight or flight, where the body was under all this high cortisol levels. Right. Then what happened if that happened for a long time? They went into this period of what we call adaptation, where the body mm -hmm. got used to it, but maladapted to it. So the body's slowly, you know, utilizing resources until the last stage, people ended up with exhaustion. And they often don't realize they're in adrenal fatigue until it, the body no longer responds. Right. And that's where you see chronic diseases. People start to get heart disease. They start to get diabetes, insomnia, uh, even cancer starts coming when that long-term adrenal stress really breaks down the body. And it could be years. People can go through that stage for 20, 30 years and not even realize it. Right. So that initial stage of the fight or flight, the high cortisol, you know, that person's like got this cortisol, right? So high cortisol initially gives you this lush, this lush, this rush, <laughs> and you feel very lush. You feel very, um, you know, you're like, I got this. You're running on adrenaline. You know, you're like, okay, I can do this. I'm a CEO. I'm a mom of three. I can run the business at the same time, drop the kids off. And that person can go on that for a bit of time when they're younger. And then what happens, we'll talk about that stage, they're still undergoing high cortisol, which is causing insulin insensitivity. It's suppressing the immune system. It's starting to affect their sleep, not 100%. And they're now starting to you know, have things like wine to put them to sleep because they're having a little bit of problem. They get into that habit. 
that's the first stage of adrenal, uh, you're on your way to adrenal burnout. And I always think of the way people realize it, they're good as long as they're moving. Once they stop talking or sit down or sit in front of the TV, they crash. So right. that's the intermittent crashes. I, my favorite example is I ask people, if you're in a meeting, what happens if you're not talking? Are you falling asleep? Are you having trouble focusing? You know, once you sit down to watch TV, can you not get back up again? Or do you fall asleep on the couch watching yeah. TV? That, that's your adrenal fatigue group. So, well, I'm talking about the different adrenal phases that they're starting off. So wired face won't do that. Wired face will be like, yep, let's do this. And let's go take the <laughs> dog for a walk and let's go for a hike. And then let's, you know, have a coffee after, you know, that's the, the wired person. Now we're going to move into the wired and tired phase. This is that you're flying high, but you crash at times. So the cortisol levels are now fluctuating, right? So the cortisol levels are now dropping where they're actually feeling um, frazzled, but they're feeling tired. So they're, they're kind of in that no man's land. And those people I see quite often have food intolerances because as you know, when you get the fight or flight situation, that wired face was getting, you know, constant cortisol, leaky gut, when you get leaky gut, the cell, remember, there's the only thing that separates your digestive lining from the rest of your body is one cell, right? So when you're on, ongoing with the fight or flight and the, the leaky gut kicks in, so you tend to, this wired um, and tired face usually ends up with food allergies, digestive issues, the belly weight now starts to show up from wired face goes into the belly starts to show up. I'm giving the different levels and the different stages for a reason because we've all been through these stages before. And sometimes you'll go through these four stages several times in your life. And it's not good if you are. And you have to stop at one of these stages and get with the program. Um, and then we move to um, wired and uh, sorry, uh, where wired and tired phase. So that's like a mixed adrenal picture, right? Where you're wired, but you're tired. So you, these people have problems sleeping at night. And then last, wait, 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 wait. Then I have. So in that wait. stage, you know, I always think of it's the yes, overtired stage where you're so Sorry. tired, you can't go to sleep. It's almost like you're over, overtired, you're like over a child. You're overtired, yes, exactly. And then inflamed face. Um, I call this inflamed face because you've now hit the two stages and you're so you've got low cortisol, low DHEA, low neurotransmitters. Um, uh, sorry, that's that's tired and flatlined. Inflamed face is low cortisol, DHEA, and high neurotransmitters. That's when you're like having your, the whole system gets messed up. But um, what's interesting, you're still able to compensate. So you're still able yes. to compensate, but you're not compensating properly. I call that the maladaptive phase, where your body's right. adapting, but yes. it cannot maintain that forever. Right. I know I'm getting my faces mixed up. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and then the last phase, which you talked about, Keith, the tired and the flat line. Think your cortisol level is like this, like flat line, where you can't get out of bed. You're so tired. You've got like, um, you've been told you have chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, autoimmune. This is when you're getting into that sort of autoimmune situation. Um, and you know, this area is where, you know, you have depressive like symptoms, anxiety. Uh, you know, we look at, have you, have you done any work on endocannabinoids, Keith, in the brain, the CB1 receptors in the amygdala? No, but I hear more and more about people using it uh, to yes. effectively help their cortisol, but I don't know a lot about it. Well, there's this interesting, like you've got this endogenous endocannabinoids. These are these receptors in the amygdala, the CB1 receptors. And they're looking at research on how things like vitamin D, echinacea, vitamin C actually help CB1 and CB2 receptors. And so there's like a lot of research on that. So people, anything that supports the immune system seems to be supporting those receptors in the brain and the amygdala, which is a super important part of, you know, you know, how you're feeling. And so that feeling of feeling good and happiness and depressed, which I think is super important in our time right now. So anything that triggers that, so when you see people that are low in vitamin C, low in vitamin D, you know, all of those deficiencies and B complex can actually result in adrenal fatigue. And it's so interesting in, in COVID, right? Those are the patients we see dying in the hospitals right. because they're not able to mount a stress response 
to fight off infection. That's that group that is most susceptible at the end of the day. I'm so glad you brought that up, Keith, because it's all about us managing the stress because unfortunately, our environment right now is not going to change um, at this very second. It will eventually, we have to be optimistic that we're going to, you know, move through this new normal in a, um, you know, we're very, uh, human beings are very adaptable. Um, so I think that as long as we start focusing on the positivity and managing our stress, then we can manage all of these um, reactions in the body. So it's so interesting you bring that up. I had a case that I'd like to bring up to yes. tell you about. So I had a woman, she's 34 years old, back in, in March, she had a urinary tract infection. But she had, you know, and I, she never got better. She wasn't feeling good and actually ended up taking three or four rounds of antibiotics without mm -hmm. any resolution. So when she came to see me, we started measuring levels. Her cortisol was almost nothing. Her vitamin C was almost zero. Her vitamin D was under 10. So it was interesting with that, those factors working, it seemed like the antibiotics didn't effectively treat the mm -hmm. urinary tract infection. It kept on coming back over and over again. Wow. And, you know, we see these in practice all the time. And how many doctors are actually measuring these things, these nutrient deficiencies, these vitamin deficiencies that are super important? And they're not expensive to take. I think it's, you know, more expensive to fix the body after once you've already put yourself into that situation than, you know, taking vitamin supplements and eating well. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple. The best investment you can make. It is. It totally <laughs> Highest is. return on investment. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we looked at those four faces, and if anybody's looking at those four faces, you can decide what face you think you are. And we're looking at, so what is the treatment for all of this, Keith? Like, what, if, what would we put together for somebody? What, could we, what kind of information can we give people today? So this is the great, greatest example of holistic approach, an integrative mm -hmm. approach, because we're going to put together diet, you know, eating properly, lifestyle, yeah. which includes exercise and actually proper exercise, proper sleep, and actually nutrient supplementation between using herbs, some vitamins and minerals, actually to help the adrenal glands work better. So that combination really works very effectively. Let's talk about lifestyle for starters. What can people start doing lifestyle-wise? So the easiest one is sleep. So we had a discussion before this about blue light. Right. Blue light is our new enemy right? Because everyone at night is on their iPhone, their computer, their TV. And the problem with blue light is blue light actually depletes melatonin more yeah. than any other light. And melatonin is one of those important hormones that actually regulate both circadian rhythm and allow our body to get proper sleep, both onset duration and time and quality. So without enough melatonin, sleep is very challenging. And blue light makes it even more challenging. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm guilty of doing it as well. I've, <laughs> I've tried to put, I've tried to put uh, the iPhone in another room, but um, it, may, you know, it's, it's an addiction. You know, it's this addiction to social media and addiction to our phones, and you know. And it's, it's, and it's so well known now, right? You go to buy glasses. One of the options when you buy glasses is to block blue light, right? You can get uh, yeah. glasses that actually have tinting, so that blue light is not emitted as much. Unbelievable. I wonder how many eye disorders we're, we're looking at <laughs> uh, in the future. Um, so exercise, low impact, super, super important. And I mean, you said sleep, but you know, people that are having problems sleeping, what I find is exercise helps. And exercise, I recommend, frankly, to do exercise in the morning. One, you get it out of the way, and two, that's when your cortisol is the highest. You don't want to be revving up cortisol in the evening necessarily. And you don't want to overexercise. I think people forget. Again, I almost think of adrenal fatigue as a, you have a gas tank. Yeah. You have 100 gallons of gas of the day. Yep. You don't want to use 95 in the morning and have only five gallons left for the rest of the day. So that's why low impact, which actually has more and good effect on actually insulin sensitivity and actually keeping your energy better. And often we know energy better in the day often leads to better sleep quality. The low impact is so important, especially if you guys have wired and tired face and um, inflamed face and flatlined face. 
super important to not do raw, raw, raw exercises. Make sure that you do the low impact. Also Pilates. Anyone who does Pilates is incredible. It's incredible with the adrenals. And also meditation that's in my book. Uh, for the Americans listening, younger skin starts in the gut. For the UK, reverse the signs of aging. There's a meditation called the Curtain Kriya. It's a multi-sensory uh, uh, meditation that actually uses your, you know, you're doing the, this kind of movement. You're actually verbally saying it. And there's been a lot of research on that, that it calms down um, the areas in the amygdala and it helps um, increase a calming effect on the body. And there's, you know, so much studies done, you know, UCLA looking at these types of meditations for depression, anxiety. So anyone who is doing meditation or has a good meditation app that you like, and I always recommend like do the meditation that you like. And a good friend of mine told me this, she, she does a lot of meditation. She's like, Nigma. I said, you know, I have problems concentrating. And she says, do the one that you like. If you like the Curtain Kriya, do the Curtain Kriya. You don't try to explore and do other things that aren't working for you. <clears throat> Actually, I use an app that helps me get my breathing and heart rate in sync. So I find for me, when my breathing and heart rate are working together, everything calms down for me. I have a lot of trouble, as you know, you know, uh, shutting down my brain. <laughs> so that is hard both of us. <laughs> so by actually getting by getting your breathing to match your heart rate, it naturally lowers that it lowers your blood pressure and allows better sleep. And it's actually a very easy thing that could take only seven to 10 minutes at a, at a time, That's, which is great. That, it's so great. Now, let's go into the herbs and the botan uh, botanical slash herbs, vitamin stuff. Keith, um, give me the lowdown on what you love. So first of all, one of the key points, and I think we have to talk about the difference between stimulating and adaptogen. Okay. So, and again, when people are really, really overdrawn in, in late phases of adrenal fatigue, we often focus on adaptogens first, where we don't want to it's like we don't want to push a rock harder and harder when someone is so depleted. So we use, and one of the best ones is ashwagandha that helps balance out cortisol levels and often used at night because it has a calming effect and it also can help stabilize mood as well. Yeah, I, ashwagandha is great for any kind of adrenal fatigue and it's safe and effective. It's not going to stimulate, it's going to more support adaptogen, right? So it's going to help um, the adrenals adapt. Um, and then we have rhodiola, which is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite ones. So that's a great one to help produce more neurotransmitters. Remember, we talked about one of the problems in adrenal fatigue is that yeah. high level of your neurotransmitter use. And again, if you look at mood, right, all the drugs for depression and anxiety, how do they work? They work by inhibiting neurotransmitters. So, and I always use the example of that prevents people from leaving the party. But you also want to bring more people to the party by producing right. more neurotransmitters. And rhodiola is a great way of doing that. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really good one. And then we have glyceriza, which is licorice root. Um, I know that one is a really good one. You have to be careful if you've got the dazzled and frazzled one because uh, licorice can actually help increase cortisol. It actually can also convert into estrogen as well. So you just have to be a little bit careful and take that as prescribed um, by your practitioner. And oftentimes when I'll use that, I won't use that in the beginning. I will focus more on adaptogens first. And then yeah. as people recover, that's a good thing to help them make more cortisol. But it's really at that post-recovery phase that we'll, I use it more often. Awesome. And then um, holy basil leaf. I love holy basil leaf. Oh, my gosh. This one is so great. It's like neuroprotective. It helps with cognitive function helps the adrenal glands. Have you used this one a lot? I've used this one so much in practice. Yeah, I use that and, I, and ashwagandha I use and I find that's really great. And for myself, it's really helped me get through a little bit stressful time called COVID-19. <laughs> just, just a little bit of stress, right? This is, this is also what I actually, what really helps bring down my stress is the increased oxytocin when, oops, just uh, got kissed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then we look at vitamins. There's three vitamins that I really love, um, just on the basics. You want to go into the vitamin C, Keith? And the so vitamin C not only helps with the immune system, but it also is in, in, involved in the production of adrenal hormones. So we learned from COVID-19 and other aspects 
and fighting infection that you need vitamin C to make your ad proper adrenal hormones Right. in that aspect. It's one of the um, vitamins that is first depleted by the adrenal glands when, when you're stressed out. And of course, we know animals like Dante can make his own vitamin C. Um, uh, I, I think you, I remember you saying bats and guinea pigs and us, we cannot make them. So we're in the same category. As and, primates. And, primates. and primates. And primates. <laughs> primates, yes. And certain fish, I heard as well, cannot make their own vitamin C. So. And what's so interesting, I was, we were telling before, in post-COVID, what I'm seeing as a pattern, people that are not recovering or developing that post-inflammatory phase, the one thing they seem to have more in common is low vitamin C levels. Right. Interesting. Uh, so keep your vitamin C high. And we do have a, um, I do have a discount on um, here. And I believe it is, I can't remember the discount code now, but I'll, I'll find it towards the end. Um, it's on the Instagram post. But um, anyone interested, you can go and get the vitamin C cocktail and also the vitamin D and the B complex. So it, the discount code is adrenal face. All right. <laughs> At checkout. Okay. And then we have vitamin D. So vitamin D helps regulate sleep or immune system. Really important. And I'll go into the vitamin B complex, which is the last group of vitamins. So you have B3, B5, B6, and B12, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. B12 has a lot of effect on regulating energy. B5 helps convert glucose and make adrenal hormones. And, and B3 is really critical in regulating mood. Mood, excuse me. Right. And, you know, again, just to reiterate, you know, people with COVID um, that are, you know, diagnosed with COVID, most of them are deficient in vitamin D, which is really interesting. Well. And actually, all three groups have been shown, and there's been studies now, that having a deficiency really impacts not only getting COVID, how badly they get COVID, and actually their post-treatment effect, and how long they actually suffer afterwards. Yeah. Okay. And then the other supplements, magnesium, my favorite in the world. Your husband. My husband. <laughs> yes. My mineral husband. <laughs> So magnesium is so critical. Remember, we're trying to prevent what we call a chronic inflammatory state. Those are the states that deplete cortisol the most. And actually, low magnesium, we talk about, we know, constipation, but also fatigue, depression, blood sugar regulation is much more challenging without it. It's one of the key minerals in the Krebs cycle to making ATP. Um, without magnesium, you cannot make energy. So super important. Uh, phosphatidylserine. So this is an interesting one. I mean, we know about this one more from ADHD. It's one of the minerals that's been studied for that. But what's interesting about it, it actually helps you recover from intense exercise. So normally with intense exercise, you'll make more cortisol. But with phosphatidylserine, the body does not have to make as much cortisol and recovery is much more important. So for myself, as I've aged, really critical for me to recover from those exercise sessions. Are you still going to the gym in the mornings? Uh, I have not gone back, but I've been, I've been doing more exercise outside. So I'm trying to get my vitamin D and other things by walking outside and doing other exercise outside. And how is the weather over there in New York? It's today. It's in the seventies. It's nice. You know, we're about to hit a little cool spell in the sixties. Tomorrow is the first day of October. So we are in fall, but it's beautiful and it's nice. Although we are seeing a little uptick in COVID here lately. Okay. So. Oh, gosh. Well, I think we're all, all going to experience that. I know Europe is. We're experiencing it here in California. Just, you know, just the way it is. Um, all right. That's why we got you guys. We need to keep our adrenals as healthy as possible. Uh, tyrosine and chromium. Tell me about those two. Beauty. So tyrosine is another one we talked about with production of neurotransmitters. Remember, high stress states deplete neurotransmitters. Yeah. Tyrosine helps bring them back, especially dopamine and norepinephrine. And chromium, which we have talked about many times in the past. So chromium works with cortisol to utilize glucose. So when you have enough chromium, you don't need as much cortisol. And again, to metabolize glucose, you have to have chromium available. It's very difficult to do without. So with chromium and cortisol, if you're in the frazzled and dazzled scene, um, would, wouldn't it be more helpful to have the chromium to take in the you know, throughout the cycles, or would you recommend taking it when the person is like flatlined, when they're not making any cortisol? 
So it's so interesting. I'd probably do it as long as you're eating, right? So if you think about utilizing food. Blood sugar. Exactly. So the efficiency is the key. So chromium okay. could be used in ACE. The only time you have to be a little bit careful is people that tend to really have a drop in blood sugar. Chromium can sometimes exacerbate that if there's not enough food available when the chromium is on board. Gotcha. Makes sense. All right. I think we've gone through all the vitamins, minerals, supplements, lifestyle, diet. We haven't gone over diet. <laughs> So, you know, we talked a little bit about avocado oil, olive oil, bringing fats into the diet for adrenal fatigue. You know, I really recommend, you know, somebody that's really suffering from bad, bad adrenal fatigue, things like bone broth, things that are easy on the digestive system. Because remember, when you're in adrenal fatigue, what's happened to your gut? It's been totally traumatized by the lack of blood supply that went to it. So if you don't have enough blood supply to your gut, you're not going to have the proper function of the gut. You're going to have some dysbiosis. Uh, there's going to be problems with the bowel movements, you know, and the fact that you're going to have problems with peristalsis when you're not getting enough blood supply. So think of all of that as a domino effect and how that affected your gut. So we want to bring the blood supply back to the gut. We want to have things like bone broths that are easy to digest. Stay away from raw vegetables and salads. Those are going to be very, very hard for your body to digest. And when you get out of the adrenal fatigue, you'll be able to start to eat things like salads and raw veggies again. And, and yeah. I think yeah. for blood sugar stabilization, when something has a lot of water, that water is not providing nutrient, nutrients for the body right. to work. So actually getting rid of that water allows you to absorb things much quicker. And very important to avoid processed foods, empty nutrition, because again, you want to be efficient. You want to take the workload off the digestive tract so that the blood sugar can be stabilized very quickly. And follow my plan in my four week, uh, in, my, in my book, it's a four week uh, food plan, what to eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, super important because that will give you the support that you need to fix your gut and also to support your adrenal glands. Um, Keith, you also have, can you talk a little bit about your book before we sign off? Because I think it's super important to get the blood sugar levels uh, supported as well. So my book, it's called Stubborn Fat Fix, which really talks about how to deal with insulin resistance. And actually my favorite topic, which is reactive hypoglycemia, which is again, blood sugar drops in reaction to stress of food. And again, in adrenal fatigue, one of the big conditions we see is actually reactive hypoglycemia. So it's really critical to stabilize. Remember, we always talk about Nigma and I, the two main factors, get your digestion and your blood sugar right, and the rest is much easier. Absolutely. You get those two intact. So Keith, how can somebody get your book if they want to get it? So actually on Amazon, you can go to Stubborn Fat Fix and look up Keith Berkowitz and it's there available. Also, there's a cookbook on the guide to flour free eating. It's a complete idiot's guide and that can help with some recipes and stuff as well. Okay. So what we're going to do, Keith, if you're up for it, I want to give away a book of mine. And um, are you happy to give away a book of yours? Sure. So if, you're, if anyone's buying on the shop uh, any of the supplements, I'm going to randomly choose somebody who puts in the code adrenal phase. So whatever, whoever purchases something, I'm going to send you a book of mine. And Keith um, will send one lucky person his book. Um, it's a really, really good book. Super important how foods and blood sugar metabolism work together. Um, I think that's super important. And what we'll do is that winner, if you can maybe send us a message on my Instagram, the one I'm about to post of this video, and let us know what face you have and what you've done to take care of your adrenal fatigue. And I'm actually going to go try and figure out what face I have. <laughs> after we're you done. go and figure out what face you have in the meantime. <laughs> so... Uh, why don't we do that and leave us a message and we will send you one of Keith's books. It's really, really helpful. You guys, this has been so much fun. Keith, as always, we've had an amazing Wellness Wednesday. Join Thank us you. next week. We have no idea what we're going to talk about next week. So please give us suggestions and we'll, we'll post it soon. All right. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Big kiss. <laughs>